Book Three, Part Seven of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Histories, Volume One, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book Three, Part Seven, Paragraphs One Hundred and Twenty-Six through One Hundred and Forty-Three. This was the end of Polycrates' string of successes, as Amasis, king of Egypt, had forewarned him. But not long after, atonement for Polycrates overtook Orates. After the death of Cambyses and the rule of the Magi, Orates stayed in Sardis, where he did not help the Persians in any way to regain the power taken from them by the Medes, but to the contrary, in this confusion killed two prominent Persians, Mitrobates, the governor from Dacilium, who had taunted him about Polycrates, and Mitrobates' son, Cranispes, and on top of many other violent acts, he set an ambush down the road after a messenger from Darius came with a message which displeased him, and killed that messenger on his homeward journey, and concealed the man's body and horse. So when Darius became king, he wanted to punish Orates for all his wrongdoing, and especially for killing Mitrobates and his son but he thought it best not to send an army openly against the satrap, seeing that everything was still in confusion, and he was still new to the royal power. Moreover, he heard that Orates was very powerful, having a guard of a thousand Persian spearmen, and being governor of the Phrygian and Lydian and Ionian province. He had recourse, then, to the following expedient. Having summoned an assembly of the most prominent Persians, he addressed them as follows. Persians, which of you will promise to do this for me, not with force and numbers, but by cunning. Where there is need for cunning, force has no business. So then, which of you would either bring me Orates alive, or kill him? For he has done the Persians no good, but much harm. He has destroyed two of us, Mitrobates and his son, and is killing my messengers that are sent to recall him, displaying an insolence that is not to be borne. So then, before he does the Persians some greater harm, he has to be punished by us with death." Darius asked this, and thirty men promised, each wanting to do it himself. Darius told them not to argue, but draw lots. They did, and the lot fell to Bagaeus, son of Artontes. Bagaeus, having drawn the lot, did as follows. He had many letters written concerning many things, and put the seal of Darius on them, and then went with them to Sardis. When he got there, and came into Arati's presence, he took out each letter in turn, and gave it to one of the royal scribes to read, all of the governors of the king have scribes. Bagaeus gave the letters to test the spearmen, whether they would consent to revolt against Dorates. Seeing that they were greatly affected by the rolls, and yet more by what was written in them, he gave another, in which were these words, Persians, King Darius forbids you to be Orates' guard. Hearing this, they lowered their spears for him. When Bagaeus saw that they obeyed the letter so far, he was encouraged, and gave the last roll to the scribe, in which was written, King Darius instructs the Persians in Sardis to kill Orates. Hearing this, the spearmen drew their scimitars and killed him at once. Thus atonement for Polycrates the Samian overtook Orates the Persian. Orates' slaves and other possessions were brought to Susa. Not long after this, it happened that Darius twisted his foot in dismounting from his horse while hunting, so violently that the ball of the ankle joint was dislocated from its socket. Darius called in the best physicians of Egypt, whom he had, until now, kept near his person. But by violently twisting the foot they made the injury worse, and for seven days and nights the king could not sleep because of the pain. On the eighth day, when he was doing poorly, some one who had heard in Sardis of the skill of Democedes of Croton told Darius of him, and he told them to bring him as quickly as possible. When they found him among the slaves of Orates, where he was forgotten, they brought him along, dragging his chains and dressed in rags. Darius asked him, when he was brought in, if he were trained in medicine. He refused to admit it, for he was afraid that if he revealed himself he would be cut off from Hellas for good. It was clear to Darius, however, that he was trained in deceit, and he ordered those who had brought him to bring along scourges and goads. Then he confessed, saying that his training was not exact, but that he had associated with the physician, and had a passing acquaintance with medicine. But when Darius turned the case over to him, and Democedes applied Greek remedies, and used gentleness instead of the Egyptian's violence, he enabled him to sleep, and in a short time had him well, although Darius had no hope of regaining the use of his foot. 
After this Darius rewarded him with the gift of two pairs of golden fetters. "'Is it your purpose?' Democedes asked. "'To double my pains for making you well?' Pleased by the retort, Darius sent him to his own wives. The eunuchs who conducted him told the women that this was the man who had given the king his life back. Each of them took a bowl and dipped it in a chest full of gold, so richly rewarding Democedes that the servant accompanying him, whose name was Sitton, collected a very great sum of gold by picking up the staters that fell from the bowls. Now this is how Democedes had come from Croton to live with Polycrates. He was oppressed by a harsh-tempered father at Croton. Since he could not stand him, he left him and went to Aegina. Within the first year after settling there, he excelled the rest of the physicians, although he had no equipment nor any medical implements. In his second year the Agitinans paid him a talent to be their public physician. In the third year the Athenians hired him for a hundred minae, and Polycrates in the fourth year for two talents. Thus he came to Samos, and not least because of this man the physicians of Croton were well respected, for at this time the best physicians in Greek countries were those of Croton, and next to them those of Cyrene. About the same time the archives had the name of being the best musicians. So now, because he had healed Darius at Susa, Democedes had a very grand house and ate at the king's table. He had everything except permission to return to the Greeks. When the Egyptian physicians, who until now had attended the king, were about to be impaled for being less skilful than a Greek, Democedes interceded with the king for them, and saved them, and he saved an Aelian seer, too, who had been a retainer of Polycrates, and was forgotten among the slaves. Democedes was a man of considerable influence with the king. A short time after this, something else occurred. There was a swelling on the breast of Atossa, the daughter of Cyrus and the wife of Darius, which broke and spread further. As long as it was small, she hid it out of shame and told no one, but when it got bad, she sent for Democedes and showed it to him. He said he would cure her, but made her swear that she would repay him by granting whatever he asked of her, and said that he would ask nothing shameful. And after he treated her and did cure her, Atossa addressed Darius in their chamber, as she had been instructed by Democedes. O king, although you have so much power, you are idle, acquiring no additional people or power for the Persians. The right thing for a man who is both young and the master of great wealth is to be seen aggrandizing himself, so that the Persians know too that they are ruled by a man. On two counts it is in your interest to do this, both so that the Persians know their leader is a man, and so that they be occupied by war and not have time to plot against you. You should sow some industry now, while you are still young, for sense grows with the growing body, but grows too old with the aging body and loses its edge for all purposes. She said this as instructed, but he replied with this, Woman, what you have said is exactly what I had in mind to do, for I have planned to make a bridge from this continent to the other continent, and lead an army against the Scythians, and this will be done in a short time. Look, Atossa said, let the Scythians go for the present. You shall have them whenever you like. I tell you, march against Hellas. I have heard of Laconian and Argive and Attic and Corinthian women, and would like to have them as servants. You have a man who is fitter than any other to instruct and guide you in everything concerning Hellas. I mean the physician who healed your foot. Darius answered, Woman, since you think that we should make an attempt on Greece first, it seems to me best that we send Persian spies with the man whom you mention, who shall tell us everything that they learn and observe, and then when I am fully informed I shall rouse myself against them. He said this, and no sooner said than did it. For the next day at dawn he summoned fifteen prominent Persians, and instructed them to go with Democedes and sail along the coast of Hellas, telling them, too, by all means to bring the physician back, and not let him escape. Having given these instructions to them, he then sent for Democedes, and asked of him that when he had shown and made clear all of Greece to the Persians, he would come back, and he told him to take all his movable goods to give his father and siblings, saying that he would give him many times as much in return, and would send with him a ship with cargo of all good things. Darius, I think, made this promise without a treacherous intent, but Democedes was afraid that Darius was testing him. Therefore he was in no hurry to accept all that was offered, but answered that he would leave his own possessions where they were, so as to have them when he returned. The ship which Darius promised him to carry the gifts for his siblings, he said he would accept. 
Having given the same instructions to Democedes, too, Darius sent them all to the coast. They came down to the city of Sidon in Phoenicia, and there chartered two triremes, as well as a great galley laden with all good things, and when everything was ready they set sail for Hellas, where they surveyed and mapped the coasts to which they came, until having viewed the greater and most famous parts they reached Tarentum in Italy. There Astrophilides, king of the Tarentines, out of sympathy for Democedes, took the steering gear off the Median ships and put the Persians under a guard, calling them spies. While they were in this plight, Democedes made his way to Croton, and Aristophilides did not set the Persians free and give them back what he had taken from their ships until the physician was in his own country. The Persians sailed from Tarentum and pursued Democedes to Croton, where they found him in the market-place and tried to seize him. Some Cretaniots, who feared the Persian power, would have given him up, but others resisted and beat the Persians with their sticks. "'Men of Croton, watch what you do,' said the Persians. "'You are harboring an escaped slave of the kings. How do you think King Darius will like this insolence? What good will it do you if he gets away from us? What city will we attack first here? Which will we try to enslave first? But the men of Croton paid no attention to them, so the Persians lost Timosides and the galley with which they had come, and sailed back for Asia, making no attempt to visit and learn of the further parts of Hellas, now that their guide was taken from them. But Democedes gave them a message as they were setting sail. They should tell Darius, he said, that Democedes was engaged to the daughter of Milan. For Darius held the name of Milan, the wrestler, in great honor, and to my thinking Democedes sought this match and paid a great sum for it, to show Darius that he was a man of influence in his own country, as well as in Persia. The Persians then put out from Croton, but their ships were wrecked on the coast of Eupigia, and they were made slaves in the country until Gillus, an exile from Tarentum, released and restored them to Darius, who was ready to give him whatever he wanted in return. Gillis chose to be restored to Tarentum, and told the story of his misfortune, but so as not to be the occasion of agitating Greece, if on his account a great expedition sailed against Italy, he said that it was enough that the Snidians alone be his escort, for he supposed that the Tarentines would be the readier to receive him back as the Snidians were their friends. Darius kept his word, and sent a messenger to the men of Snidos, telling them to take Gillis back to Tarentum. They obeyed Darius, but they could not persuade the Tarentines, and were not able to apply force. This is what happened, and these Persians were the first who came from Asia into Hellas, and they came to view the country for this reason. After this King Darius conquered Samos, the greatest of all city-states, Greek or barbarian, the reason for his conquest being this. When Cambyses, son of Cyrus, invaded Egypt, many Greeks came with the army, some to trade, as was natural, and some to see the country itself. Among them was Silosin, son of Achis, who was Polycrates' brother, and in exile from Samos. This Silosin had a stroke of good luck. He was in the market at Memphis wearing a red cloak, when Darius, at that time one of Cambyses' guard, and as yet a man of no great importance, saw him, and coveting the cloak came and tried to buy it. When Silicon saw Darius's eagerness, by good luck he said, I will not sell this for any money, but I give it to you free, if you must have it so much. Extolling this, Darius accepted the garment. Silicon supposed that he had lost his cloak out of foolish good nature. But in time Cambyses died, the seven rebelled against the Magus, and Darius of the seven came to the throne. Silicon then learned that the successor to the royal power was the man to whom he had given the garment in Egypt. So he went up to Susa, and sat in the king's antechamber, saying that he was one of Darius's benefactors. When the doorkeeper brought word of this to the king, Darius asked, But to what Greek benefactor can I owe thanks? In the little time since I have been king, hardly one of that nation has come to us, and I have, I may say, no use for any Greek. Nevertheless bring him in, so that I may know what he means." The doorkeeper brought Silicon in, and the interpreters asked him, as he stood there, who he was and what he had done to call himself the king's benefactor. Then Silicon told the story of the cloak, and said that it was he who had given it. "'Most generous man,' said Darius, "'it was you who gave me a present, when I had as yet no power. I was none the less grateful then, than I am now, when I get a big one. In return I give you gold and silver in abundance, so you may never be sorry that you did Darius.' son of Histapes, good. 
Silicon answered, Do not give me gold, O king, or silver, but Samos, my country, which our slave has now that my brother Polycrates has been killed by Orates, give me this without killing or enslaving. Having heard this, Darius sent an army, and Otanes, one of the seven, to command it, instructing him to do whatever Silicon asked. So Otanes went down to the coast and got his army ready. Now Samos was ruled by Maandrius, son of Maandrius, who had authority delegated by Polycrates. He wanted to be the justice of men, but that was impossible. For when he learned of Polycrates' death, first he set up an altar to Zeus the Liberator, and marked out around it that sacred enclosure which is still to be seen in the suburb of the city. When this had been done, he called an assembly of all the citizens, and addressed them thus. To me, as you know, have come Polycrates' scepter and all of his power, and it is in my power now to rule you. But I, so far as it lies in me, shall not do myself what I blame in my neighbor. I always disliked it that Polycrates, or any other man, should lord it over men like himself. Polycrates has fulfilled his destiny, and inviting you to share his power I proclaim equality. Only I claim for my own privilege that six talents of Polycrates' wealth be set apart for my use, and that I and my descendants keep the priesthood of Zeus the Liberator, whose temple I have founded, and now I give you freedom. Such was Maandrius's promise to the Samians. But one of them arose and answered, But you are not even fit to rule us, low-born and vermin, but you had better give an account of the monies you have handled. This was the speech of Telesarchus, a man of consequence among the citizens. But Maandrius, realizing that if he let go of the sovereignty, some one else would make himself sovereign instead, resolved not to let it go. Withdrawing into the Acropolis, he sent for the citizens individually, as if he would give an account of the money. Then he seized and bound them. So they were imprisoned, and afterwards Mandrius fell sick. His brother, Lycaretus, thought him likely to die, and, so that he might the more easily make himself master of Samos, he put all the prisoners to death. They had, it would seem, no desire to be free. End of Book 3, Part 7